So hello, it's, it's very nice to be here to talk to you. I'm principally going to talk to you about uh, lithic material from Australia and I'm doing that for uh, a, a number of reasons. Um, one is uh, in a sense to challenge you with something different and another is to show solidarity. The fact that in many parts of the world we're all exploring the same kinds of concerns. And so I think that it's a uh, it's good opportunity to, for me to, to briefly summarise some of the uh, attempts to move towards um, standard classifications in Australia and why they don't really work. Now the, the fundamental reason, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about the, a bit about the history of labelling, uh, particularly the, the backed specimens in Australia and there have been quite a lot of different criteria used. Uh, the fundamental problem though is that we need to come back and think about what these classifications do. Typological systems in archaeology, classification in general, is a way of, of labelling groups so that we can explore similarity and difference. And the consequence of that is that of course we need different divisions and different labels when we address different questions. So, so my, my viewpoint has always been that attempting to standardise a single classificatory framework um, is bound to fail because it's not going to allow you to, to sensitively measure the variation that you want to explore for every question. It's a really good idea for some questions but it's self-limiting in the sense that it, it must by definition address some of the questions that that you have in mind at the moment, but it can't address all the questions that everyone might ask for. And the history of working in Australia shows that. So people have tried to, to define things in terms of function, functional associations, or size, or shape, or the association to particular uh, blanks for these retouched items, or backing. So let me just quickly work through this. Now the first thing I have to say is that if we do uh, a, a morphometric study uh, in, in, a, and do it in a multivariate space that the, the things that we're talking about, these backed objects, do fall out f uh, compared to other retouched objects. So it is possible to not just have um, sort of vague or, or, or even um, moderately well-defined divisions but to actually measure this material, measure the angles, the, the dimensions, the, the ratios and, and um, come up for, for any particular site or location with quite quite clear and robust uh, dif uh, means for differentiating them. And the second thing I would say is that, um, uh, you, of course, it's talking to an audience who's highly skilled, so you'll all recognise that it's a retouched backed item at the top and an unretouched uh, ridge straightening flake off a core <coughs> at the bottom. But of course, it's very common when you go through museum collections that, that many of the the unretouched things that have lots of scars on the dorsal ridges have been mislabeled uh, and hence the reason why trusting the counts published in the literature is not always a good idea. So this category of, of things that we're generally talking about of, of items that are retouched bluntly were first identified in Australia in 1901 uh, and, and published in 1907 and it was published by Robert Etheridge, uh, who worked in a natural science context at the Australian Museum, and he talked about them, he described them as chipped back surgical knives. And he this is one of his illustrations, and the great thing about the illustration is you immediately know what it is, and you immediately know that he, he didn't know what he was really looking at, because there's no details, there's no, those, none of those scars are shown. He's operating on, on general shape, not being a, a modern archaeologist. Now, the, uh, the original paper by Etheridge and Whiteleg cited reports such as Browth Smythe's uh, description of the death spear thing. Uh, we now know that, that, that first of all, uh, the, the death spears are uh, not, not kind of real in Australia. They're, they're um, a, a post-contact depiction. That secondly, that the, the backed artefacts disappeared uh, more than one to two thousand years ago, so they don't have a real connection with the, the ethnographic record. So a lot of the attempts to 
uh, understandable attempts to understand these archaeological objects by reference to the ethnography. That was the first thing that people tried, but didn't terribly work. However, the notion that these things would be mounted on spears uh, caught hold. It was employed by McCarthy in the 1960s and 70s. It's still reproduced by Richard Fulliger today, and it's and it's it's widely discussed. So, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to the fact that that. Um, I'm, I'm unconvinced that any of these objects in Australia are actually used uh, on projectiles, but um, it, this was something that, that, that focused people's attention and, and really was a, uh, a key way in which they, they attempted to explore the, the, the nature and to a degree the definition of these, of these objects. The complexity is, of course, that uh, people like Gail Robinson have done some, some excellent re residue wear studies. Uh, we published that in Antiquity, the reference is there. And um, this is just a, a summary for three sites of the kind of functions that are happening. Uh, the first thing is that you can see projectile thrusting functions basically non-existent. Um, the second thing you can see is that, that you know, uh, uh, operating these, these one, when they're used, and they're not all used, um, when they're used as tools, they can be used on bone or wood or, or skin or a whole variety of things, and they can be used in various ways. And these are three sites in the same valley. So the first thing is that characterising the Australian uh, retouched forms of this, of this kind, even though they seem standardised in terms of function, is quite problematic. There's no common association. They're used in a whole range of ways, and 10 kilometres away they're used for something completely different. So that hasn't proved to be very useful. People then tried the thing that, that uh, you know, is, is, is kind of underpinning some of the discussions here. Uh, from the 1920s onwards, uh, there was a focus on these as small things, and maybe that smallness uh, related to the function, maybe it was sub part, part of the distinctiveness. So McCarthy, Bramall and Noon in 1946 described these as uh, generally limited to uh, about three, three centimetres in length. They called them pygmy implements or microliths and all the, all the sort of crescentic, uh, bilaterally symmetrical things they talked about as geometric microliths. And this, this um, reference to size seemed to work for people in Australia. It was, it was thought to be quite effective. Um, it was employed by John Mulvaney so that he had, uh, so this is his microlith graph here. And you can see that at some point in time, so this is depth below the ground surface in, the, in his famous site, at some point in time they appear, and he thought that denoted the appearance of hafting because they were so small it couldn't use them unless they were hafted and so on. So a lot of those associations about uh, uh, being on projectiles are still sort of embedded within that. Oh, sorry, bad pun embedded. Um, but uh, the problem is, of course, that, that often they are small, but sometimes they're not. And so... Uh, Australian archaeologists found themselves in a, in a context where they were defining uh, something by size, but they would come across examples, whole suites of, of, of sites where the size definition didn't fit. So this is a huge quarry. It's got several million uh, specimens on it. It's got hundreds of thousands of retouch flakes, and that's a 10 centimetre bar. So they're, they're backed all the way along. It's a regional variant where these things are really quite large and yet they are morphologically identical to the things that would be called microliths, except they're not micro. So the size thing um, uh, seems effective in some locations, but as soon as you go to other locations you find that your classification changes based on an, on an arbitrary uh, value of size. And it does, you, know, you, can, you can shift that, that boundary up or down, but it's, but it's still arbitrary. Um, and there's uh, John Evans' famous uh, picture of one of these uh, items from his book. So people also saw, tried shape. Um, they wanted to try and differentiate different forms, scrapers from, from uh, projectile points, from, from these things based on shapes. They tried symmetry. They tried uh, noting that there were asymmetrical ones. Part of the problem was that as soon as they went to classifications of, of shape, the symmetrical things like, like the, the crescents got put in one category and the asymmetrical ones were labelled as points and got put in with bifacial points. 
So as a, as a sort of you know, a branching classificatory tree, that's, that seemed very strange. It seemed strange to them at the time in the 1940s, uh, and it's very strange uh, still. That uh, division uh, was um, employed throughout the 1970s. Uh, McCarthy um, eventually put them back together as, as, a, as a, a variant within the backed group rather than as being entirely separate. And that was explored with things like length width ratios in the 1970s by people like Bob Pierce. And we can see that across uh, uh, the entire continent, the uh, things like the length width ratio and the, and the symmetry indices vary quite dramatically and in quite a, quite a patterned way. So the difficulty is, as people have been saying this morning, is that a definition made for any one region is going to apply in some regions but is going to struggle to be effective in, in other regions. Now, part of the problem is that, of course, symmetry and, sh uh, and, and shape are two different things. You can have symmetrical triangles or asymmetrical triangles and so on. So the, 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 the question that they were posing, in a sense, wasn't matched by the kind of criteria that they were employing. They wanted one thing, but they were using criteria that didn't quite do that. You can also see that when you, you metrically assess symmetry, that there's a big overlap between the, the conventional divisions of people in the, in the 60s and 70s of specimens into symmetrical and asymmetrical. And that, that big overlap is due to the fact that they're not actually using symmetry there, they're using other elements of shape. So there's obviously uh, a kind of um, uh, a practice that was not explained by the definitions that they, were, that they were using. There were more rules than they were admitting to. From the 1960s onwards, people imported a kind of concept that derived from Europe that, that these, these um, backed, retouched, blunted items were made on a, uh, a particular kind of blank, particularly the long, blady things. And this um, this was offered as an explanation for why these objects appeared in the archaeological record at a certain point. There was an enabling technology. You couldn't make them without a blade technology, and as soon as you got a blade technology, you could then produce the blanks that would enable you to do them. And in the 1970s, that made everyone feel happy because they could sort of they could they could say, well, the dingo was introduced uh, four to five thousand years ago, and the and the, uh, the the blade technology came with it. And once the blade technology was in Australia, then you could make the backed artifacts and and so on and so on. Um, of course, none of this actually works. So, for instance, if you look at uh, sites that have assemblages both before and after the appearance of lots of these uh, kind of retouched items, what you'll find is that is that if they have um, a lot of bladey kinds of flakes in the late prehistoric period, they also have a lot earlier. And if they have very few earlier, they also have very few late. In other words, there's regional variation that's site specific about the kind of technology. It's not a chronological change, it's actually a geographical pattern. Um, the next thing is that people depicted the arrival of um, blade technologies and they used these data. So this is, this is the um, um, pattern of uh, breakage for uh, flakes in the Kenneth Cave sequence. And what you can see is the period when blade technology uh, is said to have appeared actually coincides with a, uh, a certainly some sh subtle technological shift in which lots of flakes break longitudinally. And so they appear to become um, more elongate, but it's actually mostly the breakage that's happening. And then the final thing is that the, the big pulse of people retouching things in this manner is not a new thing. In fact, the production of these backed artefacts goes back to about um, 15 to 20,000. So they've been, so the technology's been around a long time, but it only became the dominant way of operating at a particular time period. So the enabling technology blade connection doesn't work on any of those grounds. Then 20 years ago, uh, well, 25 years ago, Val Attenborough and I um, uh, argued that one of the, the, the thing that united all the specimens that we were talking about was the particular form of retouching. Often um, very steep retouching, perhaps uh, retouched angles between, say, 70 and about 110 degrees, 
um, often with bi-directional backing at some, at some points, sorry that's a bad pun too, at some locations, um, that uh, this was the thing that, that all of those objects that I've shown you shared in common. It wasn't size, it wasn't, it wasn't planned shape, it was this uh, form of retouching uh, and that's really what people had actually been talking about. So that if you wanted to um, oh, so there's actually a, that, that's a mean and standard deviation on the, on the retouched edge angle. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to have a single criteria that might help you identify those objects as, uh, as different from other kinds of retouched objects, then, then that form of retouching would be, would be useful. And that brings me back to this notion that, that metrically, in uh, using multivariate analysis, you can separate those, those objects um, based on, on that criteria. Um, so look, the experience from Australia, I, I think is, it's, not, it's not that we have everything right, but I think it's, it's worth looking at how different places are exploring these issues. And uh, the, the first thing that you have to say is that, um, it depends entirely on the question that you're asking. You can't divorce the question from the classificatory decisions that, that you make. And that in Australia where people have been wanting to, to map geographically and chronologically these kinds of retouch flakes, then criteria like size, shape, function and blank haven't been very effective at that because none of them actually pick up uh, in, in a very um, robust manner, the, the identity of those things that have retouching them, and why would they? Why, why would blank shape or size tell you about the nature of retouching? So backing retouches turned out to be a more powerful characteristic for allocating things on these classes, and it's been, um, it's led to some, some, some challenges internally, is that people um, using these you know, a, a different criteria like backing retouch have all of a sudden seen um, that they should be thinking that perhaps there are similarities between big things and little things, whereas previously based on size they'd separated those out. Now the problem is that the traditional classes tend to be, tend to be um, uh, multi-dimensional and you can't replicate them in any single way. I actually, listening this morning, I actually think that while you're having a discussion about what name you will give, you're actually uh, exploring all sorts of different things. And I presume that you have different questions that underpin that. And the problem is that, that because the conventional um, uh, divisions that we've received, the classificatory divisions that we've received historically from, from our, from our um, uh, scholarly ancestors are multidimensional, that that it's actually quite difficult to pick one or two characteristics and say, well, this, this will do the job, or this will repeat what we've all been talking about in the past. Um, so, I mean, my feeling is that, you know, kind of morphometric analysis, statistical analysis, uh, is, is going to be a, a, a more powerful way to bring out the patterns that, are, that are exist in an assemblage. And so, um, in the sort of statistical calculations that I did in Australia, if I used seven variables, I could replicate the traditional typological classifications with a fair degree of success. It wasn't actually my goal. I don't care whether I repeat the traditional char characterizations. I'm actually interested in addressing questions that I have now. But um, you know, I, I tried for years to pick out one or two things that would do the job, and, and it simply didn't work. You need a constellation of things to be able to separate out these, these varied three-dimensional objects. Um, so it is possible to, to map the, the kinds of retouch forms that, that we're interested in, that I'm interested in in Australia and obviously you're all interested in various parts of the world. But I think we have to, we have to take powerful and robust uh, approaches to this. And it's, I mean, I think it is interesting to have the kind of discussions that we've had this morning and, and, and they're, they're valuable, but in the end it's, it's for me, and because and I'm a kind of outsider, it doesn't matter what you decide, but, but for me, taking a vote on whether we'll call it one thing or call it the other thing is not going to solve any of the problems that you have. Oh. And I've just said all that, so it's the same stuff. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions?
culture history of Australia is fairly well known now, isn't it? Maybe not the dating or it's, uh, but it's, look, depending on whether you apply for a research grant, you might find that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these culture histories were basically developed upon draw, draw upon typology. Absolutely, just like they were everywhere in the world, and it, and it worked because those those nineteenth century typologies that were employed in the twentieth century were trialled and selected. There were, you know, if you look back historically at the literature, there's all all sorts of varieties. And the ones that ended up getting used were the ones that were sensitive to chronological and spatial right. variants. And so, so it does establish the, the, the classification at one level. But, but the difficulty is that, that um, because these classes are multidimensional, um, different people can emphasise, can weight different characteristics. And sure. so one of the things that you find is that when I go through museum collections, um, that I find, oh, the oldest specimen you know, that, they've got a lot of real retouch flakes, but the oldest specimen isn't one of those. Um, but, it, but for them, because of the criteria they're using, it fell in. So, so, it is, so the, the culture history is well established at one level, but at another level, we've, we've completely revised the chronology right. by, by kind of renewing and re-envisioning the, the sort of classificatory approach that we take. Well, the point I want to take, no, and, and make is that for many parts of Africa, including where I work, the Horn of Africa, we don't have any, we don't have a culture history. We don't even have industries recognized, for example, in Ethiopia for the late, late Pleistocene at all, not one. And so we're really starting in a very basic way, to try to understand what the variability is within this region. And to do that, we really need some kind of way of talking to each other. And this is through typology in part. No, I'm a, I'm, I'm going to argue when I talk that you know this isn't the end of by all means. It's only the beginning, but it plays an important role in our initial understanding of variability within a region. And if we don't develop some kind of, of standardization in terminology, I, we're we're never even going to be able to get to that point. Look, um, look. Thanks for that. Look, I, I completely understand what you're saying. In, in, in a sense, you know, you're. you're you're having to go through the history of archaeology, but, but kind of in a contemporary manner in, in your region. And, and I, do, I do understand what you're saying. Um, so my point is not that for heuristic devices you might invent a classificatory system that you could share. Of course, that, that can work. But my point is that, that um, it will work only up to a certain level, is that, is that having a standardised class, classificatory approach enhances uh, comparison and, and um, diminishes your capacity to test theories about the why questions. Intri intrinsically, it, it does that. So, so, so you know, inventing heuristic classifications is very good for establishing you know, chronological change, and it's right. been very bad for going on and exploring that. And, 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 and I'm simply making the point that we should all teach our students the distinction between those two things, because you might want to do it and you might want to stop doing it at, at some point. I totally agree. Yeah, uh, just a question yeah. on the, the research question side of things. Um, with the early work in Australia and yours subsequent and, and those in between, have the research questions changed? Yes. Yes. If you want a two-minute su summary of the comments? Okay. Um, look, the the early research questions were, were the kinds of sort of fu fundamentals that, that um, uh, we're talking about. So they were things like, um, yeah, how old is human occupation in the continent? Um, is there any change? Because of course there was always this issue that Aboriginals could presume not to have changed. Um, then once you found changes. You know, were they associated with, with an environmental shift or with the introduction of the dingo? So it was just establishing associations and space-time patterns. But we have, we have reached the point, well, we've reached the point where in some regions we know that and in other regions we don't know it and, and perhaps it doesn't need to be our focus any, anymore. Um, they may or may not differ from the regions in which we do have those frameworks, but, but it's no longer our, our central question. So, I mean, my, my own concerns have been why, why is there such a level of standardisation in the metrical sense that you're, that you're talking about in, in the products of these things? 
Um, we haven't yet established, in the sense you're talking about, whether there is um, standardisation in the production systems that, that lead to them. So it's possible that we have standardised outputs for large areas, but through different production systems. And so that's, that's one question. But um, uh, all, all of my thinking over uh, quite, quite a long period now uh, about the standardisation has led me to um, want to look at the mechanisms by which that standardisation is maintained across space and through time. And uh, I don't think it can be functional. And I think the functional variation shows that it's been maintained despite quite different functions. Um, uh, they're often halved. We have lots of evidence for halving, and you might argue that that there's some sort of you know sort of standardised halving mechanism that requires that, that you know it's a selective context for for keeping a standardised form. But that's not really uh, well documented. Increasingly, I'm moving towards thinking that these are sending public signals. They're, re they're, they're locally standardised, but they vary between regions. They're not, they're not traded in. And so one of the things that I think is happening is that people are... I mean, they're using them, uh, just like you can drive a Maserati, but the Maserati is sending signals, very definitely. And, and these are sending social signals probably within the group rather than between groups. And so the question that I have at the moment is that, well, I haven't shown any distribution maps, but, but the distribution of these things um, runs across the southern two thirds of Australia and it, it almost exactly co-occurs with one language family. So I'm now investigating, I'm trying to extract a phylogenetic signal from the artifacts to match against the, the phylolinguistic signal that's been derived from, from that language spread to see if they track in the same uh, ways. So that's the kind of questions that I'm asking and, and the, the kind of the 1930s typologies won't do that for me. Um, they weren't designed for that, there's no reason they should do that. Um, and if I was asking the same questions that were being asked in the 1920s, then those classifications at some level would probably, would probably still be useful for that purpose.